Welcome to the Crossboard Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. My name is Christopher Brown, and I'm your host for this exciting journey. Over the course of this series, we'll be sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. We will learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, we believe on the, the show that the best way to understand a community is, surprisingly, to talk to the people who live and work there. That is why we are honored to have our guest on to the show today. Please help me welcome Councillor Ronaldo Agostino of the City of Windsor in the province of Ontario. Councillor, welcome to the show. What's up, brother? How are you? Not bad. So, Ronaldo, I'm going to get the first question out of the way, and it is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, my sense of duty to serve really came from being downtown in Windsor for so long. I've been a businessman down here for 35 years. I've seen incredible ups and I've seen incredible downs. And I just didn't want to be the person that didn't make a difference. You know, that I didn't want to be one of the complainers or I, you know, I, I decided that I, I thought and I think that I have solutions to issues that exist in our core and i didn't want to sit on the sidelines i wanted to see if i can make a difference and that's exactly why i'm here so you could have chosen volunteerism you could have chosen nonprofit, but in the last municipal election in ontario you chose politics you chose the yeah. best way to give back is to do it the political route so i want to know what made you decide that municipal politics would be the best way to give back and sort of be in the trenches of uh, helping out your community? Well, I, I do the not-for-profit. I'm an executive director of a boxing gym. I coach kids. I do a lot of those other things as well. But I thought this was a great opportunity to really make a difference by sitting on council. Um, there's only so many things I could do as a volunteer. There's only so many things I could do in a nonprofit organization. I wanted to do more. I wanted to express more. And I wanted to represent more. So, so really, that was the... That was the, the the needle. You know, that's where I looked at it and said, you know, this is somewhere I can do it. This is something I can do. If I win, by the grace of God, if I win, uh, this is something I could do to make a difference. And, you know, in my short period of time, I'm trying to make a big difference. Was politics something that was discussed at the dinner table growing up? Or where did your desire to even get involved in politics come from? Or was it just something that you decided one day in 2022? You know, when I was a kid, I grew up in downtown Toronto. Um, and I knew the local politician. I actually lived uh, just around the corner from, um, um, uh, you know, a, a really strong political uh, family. And, uh, you know, it was uh, Kiefer Sutherland's mom lived right around the corner from me. So our neighborhood was very politically active. And when I was a kid, I'd knock on doors. I'd do um, a little bit of campaigning for different people and different, different parties. So at a very young age, um, I was exposed to the game, I guess. And it never, you know, uh, it never really left me. Uh, you know, it really taught me advocacy and taught me, you know, that everybody has a voice because growing up as a little person, you know, growing up as somebody who had zero political affiliations or influence, you know, from a single parent family that is in the downtown Toronto, which at that time was considered uh, a non desirable place to be uh, looking at those things from that perspective and then seeing different opportunities and different ways you could change uh, really it never left me so it was always something in the back of my mind and I wanted to take the opportunity to at least try it and you know if I didn't try it I, I thought to myself as I got older I'd always regret if I never tried right so I'm glad I did so you tried in uh, the last municipal election in Ontario and ultimately you were successful but what was the what was the catalyst? Was there a burning issue for yourself that in the last election you said we need to fix this, and I believe my voice is the best one to fix this? Or was it an overarching theme? Because in our, in your duty to serve answer, you talk about the ups and downs, and I want to know was that the final push that finally said Ronaldo, you're on the ballot. I don't care what we're gonna make a even a statement if we don't win, but if we do win, then we can try and change it. What was that catalyst in that last election for you? Well, here I am as a, as a downtown business owner for 35 years. And I've seen some things happening to our core that um, are literally huge, huge challenges. And whether it's 
homelessness, people in need of supports, uh, businesses not being able to survive because a lot of the issues that are going on, I sit there and I look at it from my lens and I say, oh my goodness, we have such a great opportunity to do things down here. We have so many great changes that can make. We can literally rebirth our downtown with some moves, with some changes, with some a different perspective from somebody who, you know, and people say it all the time, I have skin in the game. You know, like I look at things differently than what other people may look at things. Uh, and I really thought that, you know what? I This is not insurmountable. This is not a challenge that can't be solved. These are issues that, you know, are, are not impossible. And to me, I'm in the business, I've always been in the business of bringing people together, you know, uh, whether it's through concerts, through events, through businesses, through boxing classes, I'm really good at bringing people together. And I saw the challenges of our downtown as being that there's this massive divide between all these political parties and these groups. And I'm like, I'm clean. I'm clean. I have no affiliation with anybody. I just want to see what's best for downtown. And when I saw that, I was like, you know what? That's my way in. That's my way of saying I can make a difference. I can make a change. And I think the voters saw that. And here I am. You, you talk about the downtown and the, the lens that you have when you look at issues, but during campaigns, you hear other lenses. You hear from the people that you are seeking their votes from. During that election, were there issues that were being brought forward that while you may have had a pulse on the community, understanding what the issues are in your community, there's always those micro issues that people sometimes bring up and say, oh, I didn't think this was an issue in our community, but I'm glad someone's talking about it. So that way, if elected, I can address it if on council. Yeah. Micro issues for us right now would have been small things like, you know, uh, basement floodings. Um you know, your your typical uh, neighborhood issues are, to me, right now, not the big issue. Uh, the one thing that I different, did differently is I went straight for the big issue. You know, and, and the, to me, the big issue for our downtown was uh, safety and security. And that's where uh, our downtown sits right now. And it's, we're not unlike any other downtown, uh, really, across the country. Uh, those are the big ones. And that's what I wanted to talk about. And that's what I wanted to work on. I didn't want to shy away from the major issues that I think other people think may be impossible to solve. You know, Did I want people to want to talk about them though, because when you talk about safety and security, there's always a resonation. Uh, there's an apprehensiveness to talk about them because you're saying to people, people don't feel safe in our communities. Were people willing to say, yeah, we agree with Ronaldo on this and we need to address this. Well, the residents sure were the business. <laughs> I don't think the politicians uh, feel that way because th these are very difficult. Like these are very difficult problems to solve. The most difficult problems to solve. Um, so as a candidate to say, you know what, not only do uh, I want to attack these problems, but here's solutions, here's ideas, here's different ways that I feel we can make our downtown cleaner, safer, friendlier, more welcome. And that's what I brought to the table, you know, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just a website or anything on paper. I was having media conferences. I was having town hall meetings. I was bringing things to the table saying, listen, here's what I want to do. Here's my plan. Here's my idea. And it turns out that uh, I got a lot of, a lot of support from different people that looked at it and said, okay, well, this sounds like somebody who actually wants to get things done. Somebody who wants to make a difference. Somebody who wants to make a change. Not, you know, the, 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 what I've found so far in my short term is that, you know, there's, there's this appetite to pass the buck. To say, well, this is not a municipal issue. This is not something a city councilor or city council can solve. This is a, a five years down the road. This is calling your MPs. And, and, and no, not with me. There's a problem, we have to do something, right? We have to do something. And as a businessman, what I learned uh, in my 35 years plus of business is indecision is worse than the wrong decision. And I find with municipal politics, there's always been that lens of not our issue, not our issue, not our issue, pass it on. And then nothing happens and nothing gets made. Nothing gets decided. And, the, and sometimes even a bad decision is better than no decision because it leads to change. And that's where I wanted 
it's what I want to do. You know, I, I want to make decisions and get things done. Ronaldo, you must have been listening to my interview that I did yesterday because it seemed like the person is saying the exact opposite of what you were just saying. So I want to ask that question to follow up on your statement there. Why do you think municipal politicians always try to pass the buck to other levels of government or push it down the uh, the uh, sort of the uh, the yard here to five years down the line? It's not an issue we can fix today. It has to be 10 years from now when we fix it. Why do you think that is from your perspective? And I'm not saying this is the city of Windsor's perspective, yeah. but I'm thinking your perspective. And I'm not, I'm not singling out the city of Windsor. I'm, it's, it's really in general. My perspective is there's, there's a lot of, it's money. It's always yeah. money, right? It comes down to money. We're talking about big, big problems that need big, big funding. And the municipality only has so many tools in its toolkit to work with. But uh, what I have is I think I have ideas. I think I have solutions that don't take um, this grandeur plan of this huge financial burden. I have ideas that I learned as a small businessman who started with nothing, right? That was able to do things because I took risks, I took on challenges, and I bailed. I bailed miserably so many times, right? But those failures led to successes. And I think that from a municipal level, we have to look at some of our problems and say, you know what? I, I can't wait for the cavalry to arrive. You know, I can't wait for um, the, 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 the feds or the provincial government to step in and say, here you go. No, I can't wait for that. And the people can't wait for that. And um, this is my perspective. And am I wrong? We'll find out in four years. So we're, we're going to be talking about some solutions to these issues later on, but I want to finish this segment with this question. Voting for yourself is a unique experience that not a lot of Canadians have had the option to do, but you put your name on the ballot. You got to go into that voting booth and put an X beside your name or call in. I know in the Ontario election, there was a, a vote, a phone ballots or email ballots for you. What was that experience like seeing your name on that ballot and putting that X beside it? For the first you know time. what? I didn't get to see my name on the ballot because at the time I didn't actually live in the ward. That oh, I, you know, like I've had a business. I've had businesses down here. I've been a resident down here for almost 35 years. So I've been in and out of living in the downtown core. Now I'm back into living in the downtown core. But when the election came at that point in time, I didn't even live in what was rezoned as the ward. So, uh, Okay, well, that, that I didn't exactly. my name on the ballot. I voted for somebody else in, in a different ward just because I had to, but I did not literally get to see my name on a piece of paper. So, well, next time you're on the ballot and you get to vote for first time you're on the ballot, you get to vote for yourself. I'll ask that question, I'll re ask that question to you. But I want to know after the election, you get the blue check mark beside your name. You are the, now the if councillor elect for the city of Windsor in your ward. How much weight and responsibility do you put on your shoulders to be prepared for each meeting that you go into, know the information that administration has presented to you, contact enough people in your community to, to understand what the community is feeling, and go in and make the right decision at the end of the day? How much weight do you put on yourself to do that? I couldn't even imagine to come up with, I would say if you took Andre the Giant, and times times him by 300 you know that's that's where i sit because to me i'm all in i'm an all-in kind of person and uh, when i say i'm gonna do something i'm gonna give every last ounce of blood in my body to try and figure it out and i think from a political perspective it's been a little bit frustrating because i may be moving too fast you know, I may be doing things that others look at as, well, that's impossible. You'll never be able to do that. Like you're, you're trying, and I get it from a lot of people and I get it, you know, people are like, you're going to burn out. You're going to burn out. You're trying too hard. You're going to burn out. You got to slow down. You got to take some time off. Uh, because I, since I started, I've been at this 24, seven, seven days a week. And it's hurt yeah. some, parts, it's hurt some parts of my life, but it's who I am and it's what I want to do. And it drives me. So the world what's the biggest learning curve that you've had to uh, it, what's the biggest learning experience that you've had over the last uh, few months in this uh, position uh just really relationship building i wouldn't say learning curve because there is no learning curve there's there's no like there's no pamphlet there's no manual there's no you know you don't get a book when you win and say hey 
here's here's what here's the way this is gonna go. Here's what your responsibilities are <laughs> gonna go. No, the first day on the job, I get a call from a friend of mine that's living in a, 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 a uh, apartment building called 1616 OLED. It's the worst residential uh, building in the city. Uh, everyone has been uh, evacuated from the building because no heat, no electricity. It's it's a, a dumpster fire. I get a call and they, my friend says, can you come here and help us right now? I jump in my car and drive there. I just have my badge. And to me, it's like, what do I do? You know what I mean? Like, so I walk in there like I'm a police officer. But luckily enough, you know, I know the building inspector because the building inspector that's there used to bartend for me 10 years ago. I know um, some of the people that live there. So I'm off to the races right away. And I'm just, you know, I'm helping uh, elderly people uh, with their with their belongings to get out of the building. I'm going to the shelter to visit with people. I'm talking to people. I'm trying to learn on the go so for me it was like boom i'm right in i was right in from day one and i haven't left from day one so i want to turn to segment two because i am cautious of time here and segment two i want to preface the first question by saying this this is a conversation between the counselor and myself this is not an opinion of counsel this is not a motion of counsel this is just his opinion so Counselor, in your opinion, as of recording this interview, what is the biggest issue, in your opinion, facing the city of Windsor today? Or the issues? You know, the, the, the one, it, I think it's downtown. I really do. It's my award. It's downtown. It seems like the rest of this city is booming. Like I tell people all the time, like, I'm a big advocate for this city. I've been a big advocate for this city for a long time. And when I hear people say that London, Ontario, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Calgary, Edmonton, that these cities are better than Windsor, it's an insult to me. You know, like I feel that the city of Windsor is the next big thing in this country, not just because of my passion for the city, but because of our proximity to Detroit. The fact that we have all these incredible amenities the fact that it's significantly warmer here than everywhere else, I feel that we are, our room to grow is massive. And the rest of this city is doing incredibly well, in my opinion. Um, it's just our downtown. It's our downtown core. And what I'm trying to do is rally all the councillors, the mayor, everyone together, say, listen, guys, let's put politics aside. Let's do some great things for downtown. Because if we can solve the issues of our downtown, then we are going to catapult we are going to catapult and being into being one of the most incredible cities and one of the top cities in the country. So I, I'm going to follow up on that with the million dollar follow up question is how are you fixing it? How are you and council fixing these issues? Because safety and security, like you said, is a very big issue. It is not something that you can just wave a magic wand and it will be fixed overnight. You need programs, you need services, you need uh, police. And while you only have a certain amount of money each year, you can't magically create more money out of thin air. How do you see yourself as counselor and council as addressing this issue of safety and security in your ward of uh, the downtown core? Well, the way I want to see it, and we'll find out if I'm right or not, is I want to make it less political. I want to get everybody at the table, which I'm doing, and we're all going to sit there and we're going to say, listen, guys, I get it. Housing first, supports, security, policing, all these things are the big issue. But it always seems to me that it's this right versus left, right? It always seems to me that this it's either one way or the other way, and there's no middle ground. And I want to be the person that says, you know what, guys? There is a middle ground here. Is it about policing? No, not entirely. Is it supports? No, not entirely, but it's a great combination of both. And it's gonna take everybody to come together, to agree to try and to say, you know, there is an aspect of more policing. There is more support that's needed. There's not just police, there's mental health workers. There's support. There's all these different challenges that are going to take everyone. It's everyone's gonna to have to come together on this one, whether it's the Canadian Mental Health Association, whether it's Housing First, which I'm a big believer in. It's getting everyone at the table to say, you're not right, but you're not wrong. And we all have to work together to solve this because I feel it's that challenge that is continuously putting us 
in the positions of playing from behind the saying, well, you're never going to be able to say you were right or wrong. We are going to say we were right, or we are going to say that we were wrong. And I look at I look at downtown Detroit as a perfect example, which is the closest um, uh, comeback in our area. It's literally a five minute drive from where I live. And I look at what happened to the city of Detroit. How did they turn things around? And the first thing they did to turn things around is they admitted that they lost, right? They went bankrupt and they said, we lost. We lost. It's over. We lost. Because what that did is that created this blank slate, this brand new fresh start. Because the next day, the canvas was cleaned. Where do we begin? And that's what I'm. That's the message I'm trying to get out to everybody and say, listen, there was this big aspiration to make downtown Windsor. We paid Peter Belmio to do a report for us 20 years ago, and his response was to turn downtown Windsor into this wonderful retail um, mecca. Well, nobody saw Amazon coming. Right. Nobody saw the, the, this online shopping world coming to where now our malls are are getting close to extinction. You know, so nobody saw what was coming and how it came. Nobody saw 9-11. Nobody saw COVID. Nobody saw all these things coming. But I want to make everyone feel that everyone's voice is welcome. Everyone's going to be part of the solution. And I'll take the back seat. Right. Because to me. I'm, I'm not looking as a city councilor as what I want to do is push my agenda so that in the next four years, I get reelected. My agenda is I want to get as many things done in four years. So if I do feel that I'm done, I can get back to my normal life, right? Because this is 24 seven, seven days a week. It's nonstop. Two in the morning, I get calls. Doesn't bother me, right? I want to see how much we can get done. So when I win my election and someone says, if you can get two of the things done that you promised in your, your, during your campaign, you, you have done great. And I said, two, I promised 20 and I want to get all 20 done, right? So I just look at things differently and this is the way I want to go. Do you feel like a referee sometimes? Because getting people all at the table is a, is a tough experience, let alone, especially in the hyper-partisan uh, political and federal levels of government that we currently have. The left doesn't want to talk to the right. The right doesn't want to talk to the left. And when it comes to municipal issues, there is no political parties, barring a few municipalities. And you're not a liberal and conservative sitting down. You're Windsor councillors sitting down. Is it hard to deal with provincial and federal governments on issues in from your experience in your time uh, timetable that you've been elected uh, that it is so hard and so frustrating that politicians at different levels of government don't even look at issues as individual issues. They look at it as liberal or conservative issues. Yeah. Well, that's I think that's one of my strong fortes is that I am a referee, you know, and um, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I, uh, I had a town hall meeting and there was a very, very, very upset resident uh, during the town hall meeting. And he has every reason to be absolutely furious with the situation. So he gets up to start to speak and he literally just goes off. He goes off and it's at the point during the town hall meeting where it could have turned the tables and made things very uncomfortable. And it would have made things very difficult for people to get to the point where we got to in the meeting. But I was able to calm him down. I was able to calm him down. I was able to reel him back in the meeting and continue moving forward. And after the meeting, people called me and said, Ronaldo, how did you do that? How did you get that guy to calm down? And I'll tell you exactly how. I knew that this was going to happen weeks ago. So I was building relationships with him. So that I knew his frustration. I knew how angry he was. I, and he has every right to be furious with what's going on in, on his street. But because I built really that relationship with him, I knew that there was a way that I could talk to him and calm him down. People say to him, you know, you're doing these town hall meetings. You're dealing with a lot of angry people. And I say, yeah, dealing with 100 people that are angry at something happened in their neighborhood is a lot easier than dealing with 15,000 people at a music festival and running out of vodka at 12.45 in the morning, right? I've been dealing with people. I've been breaking up bar fights. I've been doing all that stuff for 30 years. So I have the experience, the street experience of, of communicating with people, of getting people to just exhale, 
You know, just exhale because being angry is an important emotion. It's a very important emotion. It drives a lot of things. But being frustrated doesn't. So we have to, as people, we have to understand how to communicate with one another and be able to say, I was wrong. You know, be able to admit, but be able to listen. And that's where I think I really have a good strong point. I want to uh, talk about apathy for two seconds here, because when it comes to municipal governments, it seems like it's the forgotten government. Uh, federal politics, we always yell at uh, via Twitter or social media about what's going on federally, provincially even as well. When it comes to municipal uh, municipal politics and government, it seems like there's an apathetic nature when it comes from residents, unless their water isn't turned on or their uh, garbage isn't picked up. People just and I'm not generalizing here, just don't care. Um, in Windsor, do you see that? Do you see people actually engaging with yourself, with city staff, with city hall to deal with the issues that are in front of them? Or is there an apathetic nature where people just say, you know what, as long as my water's turned on, I'm happy. As long as my power and heat is good, I'm okay with it. Like, are people willing to give their feedback on issues, do you think? Well, I think it's starting I think it's starting and I think it's because uh, we're trying to become more engaged with our communities and with the really the, the, the essence of social media. You know, I get more messages from residents over my Facebook than I do my phone. You know, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a counselor that is, is, I put myself out there. You know, I give everybody my phone number, everyone I have, you know, I've been at 5,000 friends on Facebook way before I announced I was going to run for office. Uh, you know, I really try and connect with residents in any way, in every way I can, because I saw that during the campaign. You know, you knock on people's doors and most people, you know, I say, oh, my name's Ronald Agostino. I'm running for Ward 3 City Council. And a lot of people are like, what floor of the hospital are you running for? Like, what are you talking about? Ward? What's a ward? So... There's reasons that we're disconnected from residents. So what I try and play to people is that I'm not just a Ward 3 counselor, I'm the downtown counselor, because I think you have to relate to the community. And to most people that aren't politically active, a ward is a floor in a hospital, you know? So I try and connect with the community in different ways and use my, I guess, promoter uh, history as bringing more people in and bringing more people together. Now. It could be politically, it could be political suicide in some ways, because I find that in my short period of time, politically, I find that it's the smaller groups. If you can get a small group of people that are politically active to support you or to support your agenda, there's a, a road to success there because of that apathy. Because there's this, you know, but to me, that's not the way I want to do things. I want to bring everybody together. I want to get everybody involved. And I'm creating more, I'm bringing the awareness to people that politics does matter. Your voice as a resident does matter. And winning by 75 votes, like I won by, shows people that every vote counts. Every vote counts. So uh, there's a lot to be said in the apathetic nature of politics, especially uh, municipally. But I think that's going to change because people are starting to realize I can make a difference to my neighborhood. And there's other, there's ways to connect with the politician now that there weren't 20 years ago. Now, I, I know we said half hour, I have like three minutes left and I want to turn to tourism for two seconds here because I'm a big tourist. If you come on my show, I'm coming to your community. So get ready to see Chris Brown in Windsor, especially in the downtown area. I will come and visit some of these areas that you're about to talk to, talk to me about, but counselor, what are some tourist destinations in the city of Windsor that people need to stop at? Because we often forget municipally tourism is a big draw for some communities. Well, we have the most, uh, you know, for a, for a city our size, uh, the tourist attractions that we have in our city are incredible. Like we have a Caesars, right? Like we have a Caesars in Windsor, you know, it's, it's massive. Our downtown farmer's market, our hospitality and nightlife industry downtown used to be one of the best tourist attractions on the planet. There used to be a hundred bars and nightclubs on one street when I started uh, my 
you know, my journey here in Windsor. That's what I did. I owned bars, I owned nightclubs. I was a DJ, I was a doorman. Like the entertainment aspect of Windsor is massive. And it's one of the things that I'm really trying to give a big rebirth in, in our downtown. Like I said, our farmer's market, amazing. We have incredible hotels. Our riverfront is our Niagara Falls. It's one of the most beautiful riverfronts in the world with the backdrop of the city of Detroit. And the best thing about it is if you come to Windsor, you want to pop over and see a Tigers game, four minutes away, right? So it's this connection that we have and that we always had with not only the incredible resources and the beauty and the hospitality, the, the nature of our citizens to be welcoming, to be you know, it, it's we were a hospitality hotbed, right? And nobody knows how to take care of people better than people from the city of Windsor. We are so welcoming. We are so good-hearted, good-kinded people. And then, you know, you pair us up with having all the great amenities that Detroit offers. It's, it's we're unstoppable. You know, it's, you know, you can get a whole town room in downtown Windsor for a hundred bucks. For a hundred bucks, you can go see a, a Pistons game for 25 bucks. You know, you want to go see a Raptors game in the city of Toronto? Forget about it. You want to go see a Leafs game in the city of Toronto? Forget about it. You know, me being from Toronto, every time the Leafs come to town or the Raptors come to town, I got 30 friends that are coming down here because it's just such an incredible getaway. Our wineries, like, how do you beat Windsor? Like, it's it's baffling to me that anybody would even could even compete with us. You know, so that's well, the stuff. So my last question to you, this, uh, Ronaldo, is... What makes the city of Windsor such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? Live, work, raise a family, and play? It's the people, man. It's the people. We got the best people. You know, we literally have the best people in this city. And whether it's our automotive industry, whether it's politics, whether it's, um, you know, the casino, the hotels, the nightlife, the neighborhoods, it's the people here. The people here are the best because they will give you the shirt off their back. They're just, you know, uh, it's a hard work in town with good people and with people that care. And, you know, we are going to, this city's going to take off. It's taken off and we're going to take off like no other city in the country has the potential to. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I'm so excited for our future. Well, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this, uh, Counselor. Greatly appreciate it. I want to remind everyone, put down social media for at least five minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be better people. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.